Hey guys, welcome. Yeah, so in the last video, I showed you using the delta epsilon limit definition or the delta epsilon limit argument how to prove uh, what I've called Hey guys, welcome. Yeah, so in the previous video, I showed you how to prove the limit sum property for functions using the delta epsilon limit definition. And in the next video, I'm going to show you how to prove the limit product property uh, for functions. But in between, so here in this video, I wanted to show you something really cool, which is the uniqueness of a limit. Uh, and this is what I mean. What I mean is that if the limit is x goes to a of f of x, is equal to L and the limit is x goes to a of the same function f of x is equal to m then L best be equal to m. This is what I mean by the uniqueness of a limit. So when a limit exists it's unique to a specific number and only one number either L or M because X is going to A uh, in both cases and it's the same function and therefore we require uniqueness. So how do we prove this? Uh, this is how. So um, this is a proof by contradiction. So suppose the contrary. So suppose, suppose that suppose that this is true and this is true, but that uh, L is not equal to M. Suppose L is not equal to M. Okay. So then, uh, two different limit statements are satisfied. This statement and this statement, and using the delta epsilon limit definition, we can translate both of these statements uh, to read as follows. And so, what I'm about to write is simply uh, the translation of these two statements using the delta epsilon limit definition. And that translation would go like this For every epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta one and a delta two greater than zero such that for all x, whenever the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta 1, it follows that the absolute value of uh, sorry, f of x minus l is less than epsilon. And so um, delta 1 and then this and and this part are for translation of this using the delta epsilon limit definition, but also since for every epsilon greater than zero, we also have a delta two greater than zero, such that for all x, whenever the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta two, we'll have that the absolute value of f of x minus m is also less than epsilon. Now, we supposed that L is not equal to m, meaning that uh, there's some distance between L and M on a number line. And we don't know which is bigger. We don't know if L is bigger or M is bigger, but it doesn't matter. We can choose L to be the smaller of the two without any loss, right? So then, if this is the gap between L and M, we're going to make a very uh, good choice of epsilon to the end of where we want to go. Now, remember, epsilon just stands for a small positive real number as small as we'd like. So if we'd like, what we can do is look at uh, the absolute value of L minus M and notice that what it represents is the distance from here to here. And so if we take half the distance, so this here, that'd be the absolute value of L minus M divided by two. So that's this distance here. And this is where we're gonna choose epsilon to be. So again, uh, these two statements are a direct translation of these two statements and since epsilon is any small uh, positive real number as small as we'd like we can in particular make epsilon uh, this here yeah okay cool but then this means that we can now write the following uh, statement and this is what we could write we could write now that if we let delta equal uh, the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2, that is, if we let delta be the smaller of delta 1 and delta 2, then we can now write that for every epsilon greater than 0, there's delta greater than 0, a delta chosen in this way, such that for all x, for all x, 
Whenever the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, it will immediately follow that f minus l, f minus l is less than epsilon and um, f minus m, an absolute value in both cases, is less than epsilon. So what I'm saying is now we can write for every epsilon greater than zero, uh, there exists a delta greater than zero, the delta chosen in this way, such that for all x, whenever this is true, notice that whenever this is true, both this is true and this is true, and therefore these two things follow. That is, an absolute value f minus l is less than epsilon, and an absolute value um, f minus m is less than epsilon. Both of them follow because since delta is a small error of delta 1 and delta 2, if this is satisfied, both this and this are satisfied, these two guys. But then if these two guys are satisfied, these guys follow, is what I'm saying. So we have this here. But remember, we let epsilon be equal to L minus M an absolute value divided by 2. But wait, but wait, what I've written right here will then suggest the following. And this is what's suggested. So. Um, this is what's suggested, which is, notice that L minus M, right, an absolute value, notice that this here, if we wanted to uh, rewrite it creatively, we can write it like the following, which is we can say that it's equal to the absolute value of L minus F by F, I mean F of X, plus F minus M. Now, first, you can easily see that this is equal to this, right? Minus f plus f is zero, and then you have l minus m inside the absolute value, right? But wait, what I've just written down, this here, in turn, is lesser or equal to, it's lesser or equal to the absolute value of l minus f plus the absolute value of f minus m. Now, um, the reason why I was able to move from here to this which is put that less than or equal to and write these two, is the triangle inequality theorem. And in a different video, I showed you how to prove the triangle inequality theorem, not just state it, but proved it. So check out that video if you want to see that. But basically, it says that the absolute value of A plus B is less or equal to, this is the triangle inequality theorem I'm uh, writing down, less or equal to absolute value of A plus absolute value of B. And so if A is L minus F and B is F minus M, then uh, what I've written here is exactly uh, the triangle inequality theorem, right? Okay, okay, but, but, but wait, but wait. Uh, an absolute value, L minus F, is the same as uh, absolute value of F minus L, right? That's true, in general, absolute value of A minus B is equal to the absolute value of B minus A, we know that. So then, what I could do is, here I could say F minus L instead of L minus F. F minus L, right? Okay, cool. So now we have an absolute value, um, L minus M is less or equal to this here. But wait, we know in turn that uh, the absolute value of F minus L is less than epsilon, right? But epsilon is this, right? This is epsilon. And this is epsilon. So if I can erase here, um, you guys remember how we chose delta? But yeah, now I could say that this in turn is strictly less than, because this here is less than epsilon, what, could I, what I could say is this here is less than that, which is epsilon. So I could say less than absolute value of L minus M divided by two plus now, we also know that an absolute value f minus m is less than epsilon, but again, epsilon is this. So this here is less than absolute value of l minus m divided by 2. And this uh, strict uh, inequality is justified because this is less than this, and this here is less than that. Yeah? Okay, cool, cool, cool. But then if we add these two, they just turn into absolute value of um, L minus M. So what we have is that the absolute value of L minus M is less than the absolute value of L minus M. And that, my fellas <laughs> and gals, is a contradiction. Contradiction. Um, bye.